So I like watching book recommendation, book review videos here, uh, and they're cool. But what I often find is that they most of the time they're focused on one specific topic or genre of book. Which, when you're searching for a book of this specific genre or about this specific topic, it's pretty cool. But as just like a casual watch to have something, you know, in the background, uh, I find them to be a bit boring sometimes because it just gets the same tropes, the same kind of, the same genre, you know. So, here what I'm trying to do is doing like a general book recommendation with no focus, like with no particular area of focus whatsoever, just like books that I think are very cool and important and all of that stuff. So, let's do that. I guess I can start with saying a couple of things about the books that I'm currently reading. I wouldn't say this is like a full-on recommendation because I haven't finished them yet, but they seem to be cool, I really like them, I'm in the process of reading them, so they are probably still pretty good potential recommendations in the making. I'm currently reading like three books at the same time, of course not in the same time, but you know, in parallel, um, and it's kind of funny that they're kind of related in a way, not guess not, this is not how I planned it to be, I did not plan to read three books at the same time that are kind of related, at least somewhat, to the same thing, but they just happen to be, whether by topic or they're mostly about the same period of time, although not all of them are from the same period of time. So what I'm reading right now is, the first one is an absolute classic of like drug Psychonaut literature is um, The Confessions of an English Opium Eater by De Quincey. And um, the other one is actually, I have a copy of it. It's by, it's William James, um, The Varieties of Religious Experience. And if you don't know what the connection might be between those two, uh, you wait, because I didn't know that too. Uh, at first, but now I know. And then the third one is, is the one that I literally bought yesterday, but I've already read quite a lot of it. It's this one. It's a very, very new one. It's from the last year, I think. It's Psychonauts by Mike J. And um, they're mostly about, or at least focused, on the 19th century. And in the case of Psychonauts and Opium Eater, the connection might be pretty obvious, you know, they're uh, pe people telling about their experiences with uh, various psychoactive substances, right? But like, how, you might ask, how is that connected to um, the Varieties of Religious Experience by William James? Well, I didn't know too, but then reading Psychonauts, um, the author of Psychonauts at some point mentions that like, oh, well, actually we... We kind of forget about it now, uh, because it was kind of more or less suppressed type of information for a lot of time, but William James has consistently attributed one of the most important developments in how he views spirituality and existence to his experiences with uh, nitrous. So, yeah, all of these three people whose books I'm, I'm reading now, they're like very much psychonauts in a way, and there's a lot of interesting kind of commingling of topics, and they're more or less, even though uh, Psychonauts by Mike J, Mike J, well, you know, it's a book that has been written last year, or at least published first, last year, and um, he's clearly not from the 19th century, but he's very, very much of that tradition of writers very inspired by that kind of thing. Um, he attests to it himself in the book. It's very interesting. Um, so there, there's like a general vibe to them. It kind of matches between them, right? Okay, that's about the ones that I'm reading right now, but then the ones that I actually finished, some of them a few times, and I really, really, really recommend it. Let's go. The first one, uh, it's also actually related to psychonautics. Um, 
It's a psychedelic information theory by James Kant. Um, I don't have a physical copy of it. Most of these I would not have physical copies of them, but a couple of them I do have. So, um, psychedelic information theory, it's just, it's kind of like a multi-level look at the various states of human consciousness and like how our brains, I guess, process and generate information in these states. Uh, and, you know, the particular focus being the psychedelic experience. Um, and so in this book, he kind of considers the functions and requirements of consciousness uh, from different points of view. There's like non-linear dynamics, self-regulating feedback systems, like neurochemistry, social and interpersonal structures, uh, and stuff like that. It helped me in the long term very much with integrating my own psychedelic experiences into just the daily life and kind of understanding them more, um, how they are potentially created in your brain. Of course, it's a very difficult topic and we don't know much about the brain and how it functions still so far and we probably wouldn't, will not know most of it forever, so, you know, but it, it is a very interesting look at all of that kind of stuff. I've read it a couple of times now. The first time I, I read it, it was like, I guess more than 10 years ago, or maybe around 10 years ago. And uh, yeah, and uh, the important thing is that you can actually read it for free on uh, James's website. Just type in psychedelic information theory into your web search engine of choice. And uh, yeah, you can just read it for free. Uh, but you can also order a printed copy if you want to support the author. So, yeah. The next one, I'm gonna switch the area a little bit, and it's it's gonna be a collection of horror short stories, and it's called The Melancholy of Anatomy by Shelley Jackson. Not Shirley Jackson, Shirley Jackson is the one who wrote uh, The Haunting of Hill House. This is Shelley Jackson, it's a more modern writer. Um, yeah, so it's a collection of, I would say, like, body horror short stories, but they're very surreal, and they have a lot of very, very unique imagery that I haven't really experienced anywhere else, be it in books or any other type of media. It's all, you know, some of these stories are very, very, like, you know, feminism-coded, which I love that kind of stuff. Um, so, for example, one of, one of the stories explores the idea is that what if the Earth, like the planet, had functional, like, reproductive organs, like, to scale, and, um, you know, they just, Earth has periods, where it has menstruation cycles, and how it affects people living in it, like, it's, it's wild, it's, 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 there's a lot of very, like, unnerving imagery, check it out, and, uh, yeah, another one is, like, what if, there's also, like, an exploration of an idea that is, like, what if sperm cells were able to grow to, like, a size of full-on, like, you know, macro-universe creatures, that people keep as pets. Um, and yeah, and there's a lot of that kind of stuff. It's... It is very, like, it points, it's very gross, but like, that's kind of the idea. And I think it's gross in like, in a proper way where... If there is a proper way to be gross, but you know what I mean. Check it out. It's very, very unique. Shifting again a little bit with the topic, with the genre, I guess. It's Zeros and Ones by Sadie Plant. Um, it's more or less a very nice sort of introduction into the ideas of cyber feminism. It also touches on a lot of similar sensibilities that were explored by the whole um, CCRU circle of philosophers, being, you know, Sadie Plant being considered one of the CCRU people. And uh, yeah, the, the, the most important topics throughout the book, that are explored throughout the book, um, is how the provenance of modern computing, like 
digital stuff is in the historically female-dominated area of fabric weaving and sewing and that kind of stuff. Uh, there's also a lot of chapters on Ada Lovelace, who, if you're not familiar, was basically the first ever computer scientist in the time before computers. Um, yeah, and what this book feels like, it's mostly like a collection of semi-independent, but still connected short articles or chapters that create a general, like a very nice tapestry, if you will, of, um, of cyber feminist ideas. Uh, check it out. Okay, the next one is probably the first one that I'm gonna be, that I'm gonna issue, like a trigger warning for general blood and gore and violence and corpses stuff. Um, this is the book that you may have heard about, especially if you're into like the whole book to book talk thing, especially, especially if you're into horror. It's a book that's often placed into the category of extreme horror. I don't think, I personally don't think it is extreme horror. Uh, it is extreme at points, and it is terrifying, but I, I, I would not call it extreme horror. And it's more of a, like, so the thing is, with all of the like, gore and violence and all that stuff, it is there, it is very unpleasant, but it is kind of on the background as a framing for and actually, like, pretty, like, quietly and calmly disturbing story about just ordinary human evil, in a way. Um, I guess, uh, if you're not familiar with what it's about, um, in very broad strokes, a woman is in correspondence with a prisoned, like, serial killer who is motivated by, who was motivated by lust, you know, sadism, that kind of stuff, and, um, She's interested in him, like as a like as a psychological profile of this uh, person. And at one point, in order to kind of get his approval and like you know to maybe potentially like to gain his trust and like coerce more information from him, she accepts a little quest that he sets out for her uh, to go and. Uh, he said that, like, the quest is to return the key to the river man, and she can, she just needs to figure out what that means on her own. And the more stuff happens, the more your perceptions shift about the main character. I'll just leave it at that. Also, in terms of trigger warnings, to me personally, all of the blood and gore weren't, like, whatever. It doesn't faze me much. What legitimately, like, just ruined my week uh, after this book is, um, in the, like, in the end of the book, I, uh, there are some slurs, like, racist slurs that I didn't even know existed. So, be ready for that. Um, it's gonna ruin your, ruin your, like, day or a week, but in, in a way that I think is productive. Um, it is a very, very interesting like, character study. So, it, it's weird to say check it out, because it, it is, it's not a pleasant book, but if you're into that kind of stuff, if you're into being productively disturbed, for sure. Okay, to counteract all of that unpleasant stuff, we'll have a little bit of a, like, feminism win, female rage type book. Uh, also may have heard a, about it, um, it's Goddess of Filth by V. Castro. It's pretty short, um, it's very, like, high action, I've read it very, very, very quickly, uh, you, you just get through it very quickly, it's just a fun, quick read about a, there's a group of young Chicana women, um, and one of them gets possessed by, like, an ancient deity that makes her basically connect with her forgotten ancestry and all of that stuff and um, yeah th there's a lot of like female rage and 
you know, revenge against abusers and that kind of stuff. It, it's, it's very, like, you know, it is a fun book, in a way. It's very, like, cathartic kind of thing. So, uh, check it out. I wouldn't go into more details because, like, once again, it's pretty short, so anything I say might kind of potentially, you know, spoil it. So, check it out. The next one is a non-fiction book, again. It's called Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers by Mary Roach. And it's exactly what, what it, or I guess it's exactly what it sounds like. It's just a kind of exploration of what actually happens with your body when you die, like in real life. And not, not in terms of like, oh, what happens when we die, but in terms of like your physical body, like what will happen with it when you die, like how much rights, how many rights do you have in kind of controlling what happens to your body after your death. Um, you know, there's like a lot of exploration of like the funerary, funeral industry, uh, a lot of like, what are there, like, are there any alternatives to burial or cremation, like, is there a chance for your body to be, like, displayed as, like, in a museum? Will it be used as a crash test dummy? Um, yeah. It's just, just in general, a pretty interesting kind of exploration into that. It's a topic that's very, like, dear to my heart for various reasons. Um, there's much less on the, like, like, the business side of the funeral industry, uh, if you're more interested in that, then I would recommend, this is actually we're going to have a copy of, if you're more interested in, like, the business side of it, especially, like, the business of the funeral industry, like, in the past, uh, this is The American Way of Death by Jessica Mitford. I don't know, maybe this book is, like, super basic for someone who is from North America. I'm not. I have never been there, so when I read it a couple of years ago, there was like a lot of genuinely new information to me, and it was like very interesting how all this works, because it's not something I've learned, because I don't live in America and don't plan to. So, yeah, but there, there's a lot of very interesting stuff in it about like the business side of things. On to the next one. Okay, the next one, also non-fiction, uh, this is about... Jonestown. Uh, it's called The Road to Jonestown by Jeff Quinn. And as someone who has already have known quite a lot about the whole story of like Jonestown and Jim Jones, like people Temple, all that kind of stuff, um, there, there was still a lot of new information in me for it. But what was very interesting to me that I didn't expect to be like there in the book at all is that it kind of, it has shown me how politics work on, like, an actual interpersonal level. As in, like, not politics, as in, like, the ideas and, like, all of the, like, different movements in politics, but in, like, how does it work on, like, actual day-to-day -day basis? How do politicians do what they do? Because it's not something I've, like, ever really knew before, and... What I found really, really interesting with this is that there's a lot of just very, very low-level, like, interpersonal stuff. And, like, how do they do it? How do they, like, change stuff in the daily life of, like, a city? And um, even though there's, of course, in this book, there's a lot of very unpleasant stuff, you know, don't sound, like, a f pretty unpleasant on its own as a topic, but... There was, for me, a very interesting, like, sort of, I would even say, positive kind of lesson to be learned from it, is that it kind of showed me that no matter how, like, seemingly hostile and bureaucratically entwined all of these systems that govern us are, they're still run by people, and... That means that probably the most important thing in affecting some kind of change in these systems is 
knowing how to deal with the interpersonal connections. And um, once again, maybe it's not a surprise for anyone else, but for me, it was kind of a surprise as, as someone who's been dealing with like basically crippling social anxiety and social phobia and that kind of stuff for most of my life. Uh, it's kind of nice to learn that, especially also as someone who's been living for the last few years, who's been living in a country that's kind of infamous worldwide for how ridiculous the bureaucracy is here. Um, I kind of, like, in a weird way, that book taught me a lesson that, like, there's still people running it, and no matter how strict and weird the rules are, the, the, they, they, there are still people behind it, and the people make the decisions. And so, it, it actually helped me a lot in um, getting, getting a lot of, like, government related like bureaucracy related stuff done here because it, especially in, in our time it's a bit it's very easy to forget that you know there are people like real people because everything is like very digital and then on top of it if you're living in a place where it's like this bureaucracy on top of bureaucracy on top of bureaucracy it just feels like everything is like a number or like a piece of paper but there are people, and usually, even if some of those people might be hostile towards you, or just ambivalent, there are also some people who sympathize with your situation, and just the easiest and quickest way to achieve something, um, and to deal with stuff like that, is to just go and talk to actual people who do it. Not, like, through email, not through phones, or, like, just, like, physically, and just be as open as possible with them, and as, you know, t t to an extent, as, like, true and vulnerable, and, uh, helps, helps a lot. Uh, didn't expect for that kind of lesson to happen in a book about Jonestown, but here we go. Okay, now, this is one of my favorite books of all time. Um, it's a, it's pretty strongly related to the three books that I mentioned in the first time that I'm reading right now, uh, being Opium Eater, Psychonauts, and uh, Varieties of Religious Experience. Um, this is uh, it's the Hashish Eater by um, Fitzhugh Ludlow. It is also connected to those three books that I mentioned because. Uh, Ludlow, in the beginning of Hashish Eater, directly references The Opium Eater by De Quincey and says, I basically stole everything from De Quincey, he's the goat, go read his book instead, I'm terrible, but here's my book instead. But I actually found out, uh, to, for me personally, for my personal tastes, uh, Ludlow's writing is much, much better, and I really like it, and... Oh, it's an absolute classic of, like, psychonaut literature, and, um, this book, the way that it's written, not even, like, the contents, because the, the contents are also interesting, but the way that it's written, the, Ludlow's language legitimately changed my brain chemistry. Like, I'm not even joking, especially as someone who's not, uh, like, a native English speaker. This thing, like, changed, like, this book, like, the first few pages of this book, like, the first, like, I don't know, few chapters of this book, changed the way I construct thoughts in my head. Uh, the first time I tried reading it was, like, ten years ago or something like that, when I wasn't near as fluent in English as I am now. And I remember sitting down. I didn't finish at that time. Uh, I remember sitting down, and there were, like, paragraphs that I, that I sat with for like 20 minutes trying to understand what the hell does bro mean by that because he has this, you know, it's the 19th century, it's the mid 19th century, there's a lot of purple prose, you know, very flowery stuff, but he just takes it to it like to a new level and there are absolutely love, I understand how it's a very much of a love or hate thing, for me it's an absolute love kind of thing where there are some sentences that have been burned into my head that, like, 
They're like 11, 15 lines long sentences with like 17 commas in them. It's, it's just, and the, and also the way he writes is very non-linear and you often need to kind of cross-reference different parts of the sentences like back and forth to understand w what even is happening. So it's not just like, it is of course written linearly as a sentence on a 2D page would be, but the parts of the sentence are very like, put you in this labyrinthian kind of path that it's, it's very, very interesting to take. So... Check it out. It's it's really, really good. I, I really love the writing. This is one of the biggest inspirations for my style of writing, I guess. Mm -hmm. Now to someone a little less um, drug-induced, I would say. Um, this is a, also it's like it's a... This is also a classic, but more in the like scientific... Uh, kind of area. It's Chaos Making a New Science by James Blake. Um, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's about this relatively new branch of science. Well, you know, considering all science in general, chaos studies is a relatively new branch of science that was like started kind of around the 60s, 70s. Um, and it, it just takes you, the book takes you on an introductory journey to this branch of science. Um, there's a lot of stuff that has to do with like weather for, forecasting and fractal geometry and like models of population dynamics and nature. Um, a lot of stuff about like basically predictable unpredictability and how seemingly very simple equations and system interactions can create wildly chaotic outputs that seem to be verging on random, but they're not, but they kind of are, but they kind of not. It's, uh, yeah, also one of those books that I read quite a long time ago, and it, it also changed the way I see things a lot, especially, you know, as for someone who into psychedelics. Uh, yeah, there's this, you know, fractalness of everything that you kind of grow to appreciate after a few psychedelic experiences. So, uh, yeah. Okay, the next one. It's probably the most like esoteric uh, book so far, but it's a very famous book for an esoteric book. It's probably one of the most famous books in Western esotericism that there ever are. Uh, it's, of course, the Tibetan Book of the Dead by so many people that it's difficult to count. And what I mean, no, of course, there is an original author of the book. But the thing about this book is, is that the, 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 the core, the purported core of the book, the this translation of the set of ancient Tibetan manuscripts on the nature of death, it actually makes a very, very small part of the book, like somewhere in the middle. It, it, with time, and like... Please seek out the latest edition possible if you're going to read it. With time, this book acquired so many like layers of like forewords and prefaces and like more forewords and more pre prefaces. There's like a introductory psychological commentary by Jung. That there's an insane amount of stuff. And the thing is, with passing decades, we learn more and more about the details and like the context of this book's creation and all of this context to me at least comes to outshine the original goal of the book because it kind of became of became like a more of a like a cautionary tale a meta tale i don't know if that's a thing but there is a lot of like absolute disregard for academic credibility uh, for integrity of foreign belief systems, you know, it's it's something you would expect from you know with a you, it's something you would expect from a nineteenth century cross cultural coverage from like a, a guy from the West trying to explain 
system of beliefs that it's not his own. There's, there's some, like, lightly veiled white savior complex type thing. Um, a lot of the claims that he makes in the book that it's like, oh, th th they, they are untrue. They're basically untrue. So uh, one of the most famous or infamous ones that he makes is it, like, oh, yeah. So this book was, um, this is a translation of an interpretation of the original manuscripts by this Tibetan Lama I was friends with. And, like, he's so cool, he is, like, so knowledgeable. And then it turns out that the Lama that he was referring to is, like, a school teacher who was, was, like, also an alcoholic, which, you know, not to shame for addictions, but I guess it adds to the context. There's also some of the... Some of the proofreading of the translation was made by some, like, police officer from Tibet. It, it's wild. Uh, just check it out. It's very cool. You will learn some very basic concepts in like, Buddhist beliefs, Buddhist cosmology, and stuff like that. And that's also very interesting, and it was very influential for me, but all of the other stuff surrounding the book is so much more interesting, for sure. Now, getting into even more deeply esoteric stuff, um, this is a book that every single time I mentioned it to someone, even someone who's like, somewhat interested in this sort of area. He didn't know what it is. I'm not saying this is like a completely unknown book, because it is a... It is a book that some people know, but you need to be really, really into the thing that it, this book is about to know it. But, uh, yeah, this book is called Liber Null by Peter J. Carroll, and it's... It's basically a straightforward, like, kind of right into action guide for chaos magic. Um, it's And it, it's written and structured as a kind of an actual textbook um, or training of the, um, of the people who consider themselves to be the uh, the illuminates of Thanateros. It was like a syncretic spiritual order based on a lot of different ideas. There's like witchcraft, sorcery, Tholema, Zoskia, cultus, a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, this is probably the most important thing that I have ever read on Chaos Magic. I, I don't know how else to explain it. If you're interested in, like, not even in what Chaos Magic is, but like, how to do it, like, practical guides on rituals, and practices, this is the book that you need to read. Although, I would say, don't really treat it as, like, with anything, really. Don't really treat it as, as full-on, you need to do this, or it's gonna be wrong. It's not like a math textbook. It's a very, you know, it's a very esoteric kind of subjective thing, and, um, but you will find a lot of very interesting there's like a kind of network of concepts that you can read through and explore and integrate in any way you want into your personal life if if you want to practice chaos magic. Yeah. Great. This book, the next one, is probably the most you can recommend it to literally anyone kind of books because I think it, it's the most of the time, of the current time, um, very important. It's also like, it's an extremely popular book, it's like very, very mainstream, but I do think it's still, it, it's very good. It's uh, Bullshit Jobs by David Graeber. The good thing about it is that it touches on a lot of, you know, it's good to say that like capitalism is bad, but like, why is it bad? But like, and the thing is, a lot of time when people start, or, you know, when books start talking about capitalism and like all these other systems, it's all very, very in-depth, very philosophical, very dense, and it's difficult to get through for someone who's not like deeply into like the, the philosophy fandom, I guess. 
But this book, it, it kind of... I guess it straddles the, the sort of the, the, the line, the, the, the balance between being actually filled with a lot of very important concepts and lessons, but also being super accessible to the point where like you can recommend it to anyone above the age of like 15 and they're gonna understand it and it's gonna be important um, yeah uh, a lot of stuff about basic like structural issues with modern job market the system tm that kind of stuff without being too too much into you know and once again it's one of those things where it's relatively politically agnostic in a way which is weird to say about a book about a book that is like relatively openly capitalism bad but it is written in a way where it's relatively neutral and it's like yeah even if you are into capitalism and some of its aspects we can clearly see that the job situation is not good here's why it's not good here's what we can potentially do, or like at least this is how it currently works, so that you can understand what can be improved. Now, talking about the philosophy fandom and more dense books, this is the one I also have a copy of. This is The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness by Erich Fromm. Um, I would say right out of the bat, that it does, to my, from my point of view, contain, still contains quite a lot of, like, very anachronistic, neo-Freudian new, new kind of ideas. Uh, but even besides that, it's a very cool exploration of destructiveness as, like, a concept, as an idea, what it is, how it happens, and how. It's a purely human thing with no real equivalence in any other species. Um, and how there's, for me, the most important part, the most important parts of the book were those that are concerned with providing very specific examples of how all of the cases in which we we can see animals or you know other species creatures behaving in a way and saying, oh, that's, that's destructive, or like, that's sadistic, or like, that's, that's fueled by anger. Uh, it's, it's completely wrong. It's a very human-centric way of seeing things, because other species literally just straight up don't have the idea of destructiveness for the sake of destructiveness and all of the stuff that we can consider violent that is uh, performed like violent actions and behaviors as seen in like animals and other species uh, are extremely unnatural and folk and forced by captivity more or less or forced by uh, the animals were first forced into acting that way because of being terribly treated by humans, or by humans not understanding the animal's personal boundaries. Very cool stuff. Um, the, the other thing I would say that I don't like about the book, that like you, you can clearly skip it, at least from my point of view, maybe it's going to be interesting for you. But for me, probably the least important part of the book was like the last one, where he basically, like, there's a bunch of chapters and psychoanalyzing a certain infamous Austrian painter whose name starts with H, I don't know if you can say it on YouTube, but you know what I mean. To me, personally, didn't really add much. Maybe it's going to be interesting for you, but yeah, the whole ex exploration of destructiveness. Well, that's what the book is about, and that that's, it's, it's really cool. Back to drugs. <laughs> Anyways, uh, also, like, in terms of um, psychonaut literature, this is, like, very basic, but I still think it's pretty cool. Uh, Food, of Food, of the Food of the Gods by Terence McKenna. Uh, 
at some point of time was like a huge McKenna stan. I'm not really anymore. I think he's cool, but you know, he had a lot of <laughs> extremely wild, inaccurate ideas. Um, clearly, but you know, what did what do you expect from a person who dedicates dedicate dedicated their life to taking as many drugs as possible? But uh, it's okay. You, you're kind of in that situation. Anyone is kind of bound to come up with some wild ideas, but. Besides that, it's just, there's a lot of very interesting imagery, and, you know, by the, by the time you finish the book, you will be yearning for that fantasy of the long-gone time of tribal cultures that had all these, that basically functioned of these massive, thriving polycules, um, and, you know, there was this kind of entheogenically and psychoactively informed collective subconscious uh, and there was this worship of the mother goddess. It's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Next one, extremely short um, description. I don't know because, like, I really don't know what to say about it. It's literally what it says on the tin. Particle physics: a very short introduction by Frank Close. It's from the series of books called the Very Short Introduction, which are very short introductions in different topics. These are extremely basic, but if you're not familiar with the field, but you're kind of interested in the Indian, you want to get the general gist of it. Read it, read it, it's about particle physics, it's pretty interesting, there's a lot of cool stuff in it, I don't know. Okay, finally, some fiction again. Um, Books of Blood by Clive Barker, I don't know, also pretty, like, pretty well-known book, but I don't know. It's really, really good. One of the most influential books for me. I think I've read it when I was like 14 or something like that. And back then, it should, like, was it changed my brain chemistry, basically. I was like, oh, it was so cool and dark and edgy. And some of the imagery is still in my mind. And it's something that it affected me in long term. But then I reread it recently with a slightly better understanding of Clive Barker's life and, you know, just you know, rereading it with a lot of the new experience that I've gotten since I was 14. Uh, it was interesting in a different way, uh, where, yeah, it's still dark and edgy and cool, but, like, it's still, like, very interesting I imagery, but uh, once you learn that Clive uh, basically was a sex worker during the times of the AIDS crisis. A lot of the stuff that he writes about makes a lot of sense that I didn't see before I knew that. And, you know, when I was 14, where, you know, as anyone else, I was pretty stupid. But there's some, there's some very interesting connotations to all of these stories when you know his life story. Really cool stuff. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's really good. Another book that is very influential for me, one of the most important books in my last, like, ten years, it's Living Buddhas, The Self-Mummified Monks of Yamagata, Japan, by Ken Jeremiah. Uh, as you might guess, it's about the <laughs> self-mummified monks of Yamagata, Japan. Um, the, the thing is, this is a topic that, you know, you often see covered in some of, like, you know, horror sides of, like, the internet and YouTube. It's like, oh, these monks mummified themselves, it's so creepy, like, why did they do it? That kind of thing. But, like, it's generally a very, very interesting topic. I remember that this topic is very dear to my heart. And it's, it's kind of essential to me as a person. Because at around, I don't know, it was like, ten, I was 10 years old or something like that, I randomly saw like a TV program, we had TV programs back then, I guess, about this sort of Buddhist monks engaging in self-mummification. Um, and yeah, I just saw it, like in the middle of the day randomly, when I was like age 10. No context, I've never seen it repeated, like ever again, and he just sat with me for all of my life after that. 
and um, I now I read the book and it explained a lot of this stuff uh, why potentially people did it how they did it what are the historical and cultural and religious and spiritual subtensions of people just doing that straight up doing it which if you don't know um, self mummification especially as performed by these monks of Yamagata Japan who were mostly of this um, syncretic faith system called um, Shugendo it's like a mix of Buddhism and Hinduism and Taoism and uh, Shinto and so what they did is that at some point in their life they started like they some of them started going on this like extremely arduous few years of just total asceticism they gradually winnowed down their diet to basically just high needles and nuts and at some point they started drinking this thing that's called like um this kind of tea preparation made from the urushi tree which is like a tree that they made make like from the juice tree juice of which they make lacquer so they were basically drinking like lacquer preparations and all of this was made to make their bodies as dry and inhospitable to microbes as possible. And so when they felt like they did it, it usually took around three years of daily that, those kind of practices. And uh, yeah, they were then uh, lowered into a sort of grave to die. And then in a few years, They've been checked on and uh, they might have been successful in mummifying themselves. And if they were, they were worshipped as have successfully achieved the status of the Buddha in, in the flesh. And they were in a way considered and still are considered like half alive in a way. And they would be like prepared, their bodies were prepared in a special way and put into shrines and worshipped as, well, as what they call a bodhisattva. Um, very fascinating. Check it out. This this book is still one of the, I, I think it's, it's, no, it's probably the best source of information, like the best one source of information on this topic that I've ever been able to find. So, and as a last thing that I'm going to mention today, it's not all of the books, but from the ones that I kind of remember that I have on hand with me. This is the rec recent read for me. It's something I wanted to read for a very long time, but I finally got to reading it recently. And it's also, it's very, very, it influenced me a lot, um, especially in the latest time with all of my creative stuff, with all of my writing projects. It influenced me a lot. House of Leaves. Uh, it's like this book was like, you know, tailor-made for, for like autistic people who <laughs> just obsess about everything. And it's, um, I, I, I don't know how to explain it. If you don't know what it is, it's a book that's written in a very weird, like, meta-narrative way with a bunch of weird design choices, there's like text within text within text and it's all a huge labyrinth of obsession. It's a book that teaches you about how obsession is not the best thing you can do with your life uh, by making you obsessed with this book. I, I don't know how to explain it. It's one of those things where, like, if it's a book for you, you're gonna read it. Sooner or later, you're gonna read it, and you are going to love it and hate it, 
and love it and hate it and it's going to be very important and House of Leaves, I don't know. That's going to be, that's, that's going to be it for today, I think. There are many more books that I could talk about, but these are the ones that I have for today. And yeah, I hope you liked it. Have you read any of these books yourself? Because if you did, I would like to know your opinions. And maybe you can recommend something that's kind of similar to one of those. Because that would be cool. Because I'm absolutely up for reading stuff that's similar to any of these. So, if you know, well, let me know. And as an obligatory self-promotion thing, check out my Instagram at hyperdimensionalpetridity. I finally started releasing my, like, have my first like self-published release kind of thing. If you're into cool graphic design and uh, twisting meta narratives with unreliable narrators, and you're also a lesbian and an esoteric Betty, yeah, check it out. It's for you.